I don't know where things broke down, but they did. Somewhere our modern world promised that technology would help us, connect us, but we're more divided than ever and more alone. The American dream is that our children would be better off than we were, but we aren't even sure where we're going, let alone how to get our kids there. Where can we go for help? Where are we gonna go to find wisdom in a world of cluttered voices? Is there any way we can get help? But what if there's a way forward through these problems? What if there are actual solutions for these modern issues? And the only thing it takes is for us to call for help. We have been working our way through this roadside assistance that you helped us design. You kind of told us some, some of the topics that you'd like to talk about. So we've talked about over the last 10 weeks actually now, um, loneliness and the role of tech in our lives. And then the very difficult topic of parenting. And I wanna say that as we talk about parenting, sometimes I will give you some generalities or some things that I'm talking about. But of course, there are always special circumstances where what I say does not apply. You may have a child that has special needs, has special circumstances. Every family is absolutely unique and different. So I'm trusting that the Spirit will guide you and that you'll have wisdom to kind of discern. I may say something that's right for most of us, but it's absolutely wrong for you in terms of your situation. So if I've said anything in the last two weeks that has offended anybody, um, I have come as a humble sojourner here. I am not the parenting expert, and there are no three easy steps to successful children. Um, and if there were, I would, I would write books about it and I would not be here. Um, <laughs> because it would just be bad stewardship to keep that message just with y'all. I would be going everywhere I could if I had that. It just doesn't exist. And it's not intended to exist. Every person is meant to have their own faith journey. And as parents, we try to guide these little people along. So um, I just say that as uh, we're gonna do a wrap it up and I'm gonna talk about one final, I also would say, let me say this. What I'm gonna say today is in the context of the last two messages, just particularly last week. And so if you did miss it, um, there's a foundation in there about discovering how your child is per the personality and giftedness that they have and, and helping them move from entitlement to responsibility. There's some things in that message that are really important that we're gonna build on today, so I'd encourage you to go back and listen to them if you feel like that would be helpful for you. Okay, and then at the end, we are gonna have questions, uh, Q&A. You can text them in, and uh, you've seen that number. We'll show it to you one more time right here, maybe. Uh, and there you go, they're, they're awesome up there. You just can hardly, you can hardly throw them for a loop. And so, uh, and trust me, I'm, I try. Uh, but uh, there's the number, just go ahead and get it typed in and then as, as, uh, as a question comes up, just text it in and it'll go to uh, Ben and uh, we'll, Dane and I will do our best to address them as we get to the end. Okay, let's pray and let's jump in. Father, thank you for the opportunity to declare your worth and we, we just say again, what a beautiful name, what a wonderful name, what a powerful name Jesus is. And we gather in that name, not on our merit, but on his, on the basis of his work on our behalf, we have now gathered as your people. And we ask that you would take this time, you would help us to navigate this difficult topic. We carry our own wounds from being parented um, we carry our own regrets from the parentings that we have done. We carry our, our, our sadness about the, the, around the parenting issue about how we can't parent yet or we, we don't, we've missed opportunities. All of those kinds of things, God, you just need to break through all of those barriers and do something in us that we might move forward, be changed by you. So help us, please, in Jesus' name, amen. The admissions process at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point is very difficult to say the least. It begins with about 14,000 applicants every year and that 14,000 just through the process of SAT and ACT scores, class rank, um, interview processes, all of the, the, the fact that you've gotta get a recommendation from a U.S. Senator or the Vice President or a Congressperson, I mean, it, it's a, it is difficult, very difficult to get in. And um, in that process, that 14,000 gets narrowed down to 1,200. 
Fun part about last night, in the first service, gal came up, young gal came up, she, her name was Jessica. She's made it to the 1200. And she, she goes next week or next month to there. So that's right here among us. And so that's pretty cool. And then another guy came up at the 640 service and said, I graduated from West Point. I, I saw that. And so I'm like, wow. We, th so this is, we're talking about a select few. Now, because it is so stringent and so hard, it, it, the West Point has spent decades trying to be able to measure how they can determine and predict success for recruits that come in. And they measure all kinds of things. SAT, ACT score, high school rank adjusted for the number of student, expert appraisals of leadership potential, performance, objective measures, physical fitness tests. They do it all. And then they come up with what's called a whole, candidate, uh, a whole cadet score, a whole candidate score. And then they'll go into, at the end of it, right before they begin their freshman year in, at West Point, they go into a seven-week process called The Beast. That's what Jessica's about to enter into. And it's seven days a week of five in the morning till 10 at night of grinding these cadets, these recruits down, breaking them down so they can be built back up. It is excruciating. 20% of the 1,200, 20% will, will drop out, will not make it through. And they are frustrated at West Point because they, keep, they can't understand. Why do they drop out? They keep, they keep getting hung up. They, even if you have a super high um, whole score, that it, there's no correlation between this score of all of these measurements and in terms of who stays and who goes. There's no correlation. Now, a gal named Angela Duckworth, who wrote a book called Grit... Um, she was exposed to this process as well as some research that was around Harvard's recruiting process and admissions process. And she realized that there, you can measure all of those things, but there's one thing that you need to measure that she calls grit. And it's this passion plus perseverance. Passion plus perseverance, in particularly for long-term goals. Kinds of people trying to measure people that will set their, their hearts and their minds towards a task and stay at it and not quit. And it is in this process that she kind of comes up with this mathematic equation that she says this, talent plus effort equals skill and skill plus effort equals achievement. Talent plus effort equals skill. Skill plus effort equals achievement. And when you put these two equations beside each other, here's what you notice. Effort counts twice. You can have the best SAT or AT, ACT test scores. You can have all of these kinds of class ranks. You can do all of this work. But if you don't have grit, chances are you're not gonna make it or you're not gonna perform near as well as, you, as the potentially you could have. Now, here's the deal. Possibly, in parenting, possibly, the most important character needed that we need to pass on to our kids is perseverance. And yet, I will almost promise you that most of the parents in the room have no perseverance plan for their kid. They got an educational plan. They got a behavioral plan. You got to get out of diapers plan. <laughs> but this is something that you've never probably even given some thought to. And what I want to say to you is, is I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this because not because Angela Duckworth says it's a good idea, but for 2,000 years, the church has told us that perseverance is the needed character trait for us to be people of hope. Let me show you. Romans chapter five, beginning at verse one. Therefore, therefore is a literary marker that Paul uses in the book of Romans to say, I'm changing subjects. And he's gone from the effects of sin and what Jesus did um, about sin to now in chapter five, he's declaring, he's going to explain over the next several chapters what justification is like. And so he's gonna say this, since we have been justified through faith, and that's a, that's a declaration of something that has been accomplished in the past that has results moving into the future. This is done. It's not something that you're, you're going to be given. You are declared righteous. You are declared justified by the work of Christ and his merit, his work on the cross, not your own. 
It is declared over you. Yeah, you don't behave righteous all the time. That's, that's, that's a, behavior is a different thing. This is um, in terms of legally, a legal term of being declared righteous because of the work of Christ. He, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he'll just begin to lay out several benefits of this justification that comes from Jesus. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. That seems very strange. How could we do that? Why would we do that? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love for us into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. This declared righteousness puts us on a, if you would look at it this way, a heavenly parenting perspective for God and his children. And he wants, what he's in the process of making people that are like Jesus, people of hope, that have character, but to get to those two traits, you've gotta work your way through. So he says that we have all of these benefits. We have peace, we have access to God because of Jesus. We have joy in our sufferings. Meaning has come to the sufferings that seems meaningless. Meaning is now there, and we have hope. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about this perseverance that means to stand in one place, to stand firm, to stand up under something to stand against something. And it is this gentle non-cooperation with evil that we have in the midst of us that we are persevering through this life and it is accomplishing for us character and then character hope. But now, here's the deal. The road to hope is always the same. It goes like this. First step is suffering. Stuff goes poorly. Then suffering comes and you persevere under it. You stand under it, against it. And as you do that, your character is built. And as character is built, you gain hope. Now, reverse engineering this thing back, as a parent, what we wanna do is teach our children to suffer well. to suffer in such a way that character can be built into our lives. Now, I know that seems almost counterintuitive, and it is certainly counterculture to the parenting goals that we have in in our culture. Because our our, our culture would say, relieve all suffering, rescue from all suffering. And I would suggest to you that perhaps... That's, there's a different way to do that. Aristotle, in one of my favorite quotes, Aristotle says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act. It's a habit. If you wanna raise excellent kids, they've gotta practice it. And the road to this excellence, the road to this character is through suffering. Now, how do you develop perseverance as a parent? How do you, how do you parent for this kind of thing? Well, in the book, Grit, um, Duckworth has a quadrant that she has towards the back of her book, and let me show it to you here. And basically, this will, everybody should be able to place themselves in terms of what kind of a person you are. Not just parent, but person. Nobody gets a pass today because we're talking about parenting. This is, this is, this is, this is, this, the road to character is the same for kids as it is for singles. Now, that's how God, that's the school of, of character for us. So as you look at this, you say, okay, there's, there, you can be either demanding or undemanding in terms of a parent, and you can be supportive or unsupportive. And everybody here errs towards one end of those things or another. For me, for my example, I'm super supportive by personality. I am a you-can-do-it kind of a guy. And I'm probably less demanding than most, which would surprise some of you, but that's, I'm just like, whatever. My wife, um, I would think it's fair to say, I don't want to speak for her, and she can defend herself when we give her a mic in just a minute, but I would say she's, and she will, if, but I would say she's more, much more demanding than me. She's much more exact. If it says to do this, you do that. I, I kind of look at it and go, well, just kind of. And so all of us, but here's, here's the research. The, what the research says that, that Angela Duckworth comes up with is, is that the other types of parenting, 
uh, the authoritarian, the neglectful, the permissive, they are so inadequate compared to wise parenting that you, what, the goal is just to get move towards wise parenting. Wherever you are on the quadrant, move towards that. Because she says studies show that the benefit for your kid is in the 30 to 40 percentile in every category that's good. Every category in terms of how they do in school, how they do socially, how they do in achievements, how, how they, everything is 30 to 40% better. If you can move towards this balance between demanding and supportive. Now, the scriptures talk about Jesus being the perfect person to do this. So as we call you to be like Christ, we're actually moving you and calling you to be a wise parent or a wise person because it says when they describe who Jesus is, it says Jesus was full of grace and truth, support, and demand. And you see this over and over and over in the scriptures. Now, let me show you. I'm gonna show you a video here. And as you watch this video, I think it will help you realize, am I more of a demanding or undemanding? Am I more supportive or unsupportive? Just pay attention to the emotions as you watch this video. Bring it up hard and breathe down fast. Hard and fast. Not Let's go, boy. Don't fall, you gotta stay in your feet. Don't fall. Phoenix, go straight through. Back up, back up. Make a fight, you said it's a good one. Now hit it hard. Hit it with the heel. Come on, Phoenix. Hit it with the heel. You gotta listen. Hit it with the heel. Yes, you can do it. Come on. Yes, you can do it. You gotta do it. Look at me. You have to hit it hard, though. You cannot hit it light. You have to hit it hard. Go. That's not hard. You touch it. When I watched that, I was like, that kid's too young to break wood. <laughs> what, is, what is that coach doing? This is not fair. He's being too harsh. Cut him some slack. Give him a pass. Those are the things that, I mean, when I'm watching it for the first time, I am like this, and then he breaks the wood and I start bawling. I mean, I don't know, I, maybe it was just a, I was an emotional day, but I was just, I mean, I'm bawling. As you sat there, some of you were going, kick it, kick it, come on, kick it, get up, kick it. And some of you were going, no, let him off, let him go, it's okay, give him a pass. Isn't it true when you saw the first kick, you thought to yourself, there's no way that kid will break wood. No way. I'll tell you what they talked about that night at the dinner table in his home. Dad, I broke wood today. He carried those two pieces of wood probably to school and showed people, I broke this wood. Can I just say to you, there's something in your life that seems so difficult that you could never do it. And yet it keeps coming up and it won't go away. Persevere. Persevere. Keep kicking. And see your character grow. Now, how do we do that for kids? Here's a few thoughts, and then we'll, have, we'll take some questions. A few thoughts. First, take starting stuff seriously. Now, I, don't, I didn't say start taking stuff seriously. I said take starting stuff seriously. Some of you in the room determined the best you could, that by God's grace and your own goals, that there was something important for you to do in 2019, and you have quit. I don't know what it was. Less coffee, 
less tobacco, getting up earlier, not yelling at your kids, not yelling at your employees. I, mean, I don't know what it was. I have no idea. But, but in the months that have passed, now that we're halfway through the year, you have quit. If you got kids in the house, they are watching. It's a big deal. If your kids are involved in something and you determine, we believe, we've talked about it, we've taken it seriously, okay, we're gonna do this, and then it gets hard and they wanna stop, it's a big deal when they quit. Take starting stuff seriously because you need to finish. So just, that would be my first thing is that I think we are way too casual. Oh, we'll give it a try. No. In the words of Yoda, <laughs> try not, you must. There is no try. You do it. Okay, secondly, strongly discourage quitting anything started. Now, you kind of already get this, but I can remember in high school, I tried to quit football and a coach just wouldn't let me. Had I quit football, I would not have finished high school. There is no question in my mind. I would have not finished. Had I not finished high school, I would have never had a dream to go to college. I wanted to quit and this coach just wouldn't let me. Every reason, every excuse I came up with, he just shot it down and figured it out. Strongly discourage quitting whenever you can. I was in college, now I'm in college, I'm playing football and I go out on the football field, it's about 110 outside and it's, it's there's a factory close and the wind's wrong and it stinks and it's 110. I, I dro literally drop my helmet on the football field and I walk back into the, to the field house and I'm quitting. I am done. I'm just done. 110, this is ridiculous. Any wise person would call off practice. I'm done. Coach comes in. I can't repeat what he said. <laughs> he just won't let me quit. Had I quit in college, I would not have finished college. Sport kept me in. And so it, quitting's a big thing. Now, if it give, there, are, there are good reasons to quit things. So and you've got to navigate that with your kids. and You've got to be able to do that. But, but tr strongly discourage quitting as often as possible. Reward, third, reward finishing and Perseverance. Reward it. So make it a big deal when you start and when you get to the end of it, reward it, celebrate it. Even if you just notice it and mention it and it's part of the prayers of the evening. Little Johnny was having a hard time with math and he stuck with it and he finished his homework and he did the assignment. Thank you God for allowing him to persevere. Reward it when you see it, every time you see it. Pay attention to it. Reward it in your own life. If you've got a goal and you've got something going on and you, you stay with it and you finish the goal, celebrate it. Celebrate it big. Unless the goal was to save money, then, then no, don't maybe less celebration. But other than that, celebrate it. <laughs> and then fourth, work at seasonal goals. Work at setting seasonal goals. There's a chance that right now you've got goals for work you maybe got goals for a workout program, but you may not have any goals for your children right now in this. What, is, what are you gonna accomplish this summer with your kids? There should be some time where you sit down and you say, Let's, this is what we're gonna do this summer. We're gonna, run a, we're gonna run a 10K together. We're gonna run the Wharf to Wharf in Santa Cruz. When is the Wharf to Wharf? I don't even know when it is. So uh, this might not work, but um, I just remember I ran it with my son because he wanted to. It's the longest I've ever run in my life. I've never done it since. I never will do it again. I hate running. <laughs> but there was a goal one year. We said we were gonna do it. We did it together. You, you, you find out what you wanna do and you set some goals. You, get, you gather around, you collectively set those goals. You agree upon them and then you begin to work for them. There shouldn't be times in your life when I say, what are y'all working on as a family? And you're like, I don't know. We're just trying to survive summer. no. You're not, you're not doing that. You're doing something else. What is it? 
Okay, now, let's, let's take Dana. Dana has agreed to come up, and it's super important that we balance what I just said with wisdom, and so that's why I've asked Dana to come. And then Ben's gonna field, Ben's gonna field questions. The, the things that you text in will go to his number. The number will not be active um, after today, so you can't like text him in next week because um, it'll no longer be active. So what have you got for us, Ben? Okay. So Steve, last week you talked about helping our kids move from zeal to giftedness. So how do you do that given that our kids are gonna start things that they will not be gifted in? Yeah, they're almost certainly gonna start some things that they're not gifted in. But remember I talked about the, the way you manage from zeal to giftedness is you manage the exploration. You manage the exploration. Now, when I say you can't ever quit something, I mean, se- I mean seasonal quitting. So if they were to say, I, I want to try soccer. You know, our little CJ is kind of hot on several things right now. He loves everything, but um, soccer's one of them. So we're going to encourage him to do a soccer season. His birthday gift was we helped him be able to do that next time, if that's what he chooses to do. And what we'll, we're talking about is finishing the season. And then if, when the season's over, if he wants to stop and realizes it's, no, it's not, no longer any good, then that's fine. It's fine at the end of that. I'm not saying once you start soccer as a six-year-old, you gotta you know, pursue it your whole life. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an agreement. When you enter into a season, you kind of agree to finish the season and, and you don't agree to be there 10 years from now. So just that kind of a thing is what I'm talking about. Also, I was thinking how many of you have probably tried some kind of musical instrument and when you first started, uh, no one in the house wanted you to keep going. Yeah. But, um, but over time, you, either, you realize either that that person has some talent or skill or heart for this or they don't. Even, sometimes as parents, we honestly, it's about us and not about our child. So part of that is also realizing what are their passions and not or what are our passions for them. And there's a difference there. So, yes, encourage, support, give them that coach's talk where you push, no, you can't stop yet. But eventually there needs to be that conversation. Is this what they want to do? And then find those things that they're interested in and help them stick with those. Yeah, another thing that just came to my mind is is you need to be able to discern as a parent um, what's hard and what's harmful. Just because something's hard doesn't mean you should quit. If it's harmful, maybe you should, maybe you should get out of it. You know, there, there are coaching dynamics. If it's a sport or a teacher, there's teacher coach, or di- coaching dynamics where someone is harsh and the, and the personality of your child is, is they're just very, they don't respond to that harshness very well. It, it, it's, it's, it's really beating them down. Well, that's harmful now. It's not just, it's not just hard, it's harmful. And so you've got to discern the difference between hard Quitting something just because it's hard is, is like, that's illegal. That's not, that doesn't, it's not allowed. But, but you've got to discern what's harmful and um, be able to kind of help them navigate that. That's, great that's a great distinction. Um, kind of related to that, so it's going to be pretty easy when our kids try something, then they're through the roof good at it. But our kids are also going to try stuff where they're going to lose or quote unquote fail. It won't be a success story for them. How do we harness those? Mm -hmm. so that it's a win for our kids long term. You know, I think that's the, uh, some of the important things is not just when they're good at it, but when they aren't good at things. Um, That's that failure. That's that perseverance. It's easy to persevere when you're really good at something. So that's the thing of uh, parenting, not to rescue in those situations, not try to fix it for them, but work with them in the midst of it to learn those lessons. There's kind of come around uh, our culture now where, you know, everybody gets a first place trophy no matter what you did or a blue ribbon and so forth. I, I understand the thought behind it. It's then that self-esteem builds and then they'll learn to, you know, accept failure in the future and so forth. But if we don't start that when children are young to understand, there are times when someone is a winner and someone's a loser. Ooh, that sounded bad. I don't mean it that way. But when someone doesn't get the prize, if we don't train our kids when they're little, then as they grow, they yeah. don't understand the failures and how those can happen because we protected them from all of that failure in um, 
school or wherever it was and, and not make, you know, going to the teacher when they didn't make that A and saying, nope, my kid has to make an A, that, that's not helpful to them. They need to learn in that process what it looks like and it can be difficult for us to watch. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, if everybody wins, nobody did. Just remember that. I mean, that's the way competition works. And I will tell you this, you want your kids to learn this when it's six, they're six or seven years old because I will promise you in the workforce when they're 26, there will be competition. And if they have not learned to recognize a loss and, and how competition works, then it'll, it'll, it'll break them up when they're 26 or 30. So um, if, you're, if you're honest with yourself, everybody in the room, everybody watching, some of your greatest lessons in life were what were called losses. It says we can rejoice in our sufferings, not in our victories. The road to character is through suffering. And so continually rescuing you and your kid out of Suffering situations is robbing us, robbing him from the chance to be able to do that. And you, you as well, you, you as well. If you continue to bail on situations that just get hard, um, you end up missing out on the, on the great benefit that God might have had for you. You know, one other thing is in my personality, which, um, you know, we all have different strengths and weaknesses within our personality. But in mine, um, I don't try a lot of things uh, if I don't think I'm going to be successful at it. Um, I, I really wish my parents would have mm. pushed me to try a few thing, more things, even if I didn't know whether I would be good at it or not, so that maybe it would become that uh, practice of actually risking a little bit more, yeah. going in on things where I might be good at it. I just don't know that yet, but it takes some failures along the way to begin to see that. Okay, so how do you handle it? Any advice you have when one parent is high demand, the other parent is high support, and it's causing fractures within the marriage to try and figure out this parenting thing? Yeah, how did you handle that? <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think that's true of us. I think we move towards one another, but one of the things is, is that um, in parenting, one of the main things is to work it out with each other, not in front of the kids, so that you have a united front when you come together in a certain situation. So uh, Steve says that he's not quite demanding, but when he was a football coach, he was pretty demanding of his players and the things that he would expect of them. So it, it's probably around areas that we're passionate about too, that we seem to be either more demanding or more supportive. And so moving towards those things together and knowing the strengths and weaknesses of both personalities as parents and bringing those together. But actually, I think a lot of it is just that conversations that you have when you're not in front of the kids. I mean, honestly, I don't think they, you have to do this anymore. But when our kids had to learn the capitals of the 50 states, I thought it was going to die. It was like, oh my gosh, really? They have to do a test. I didn't know the 50 states, but we got flashcards, put them on the floor. We were tears, all of that I was kind busy of stuff. then. I, I had to. <laughs> That's when he was not very supportive engagement. during then. But, but those things, it's just those things that you do it together and you work on it with them. That's not rescuing them. That is being supportive with them to say, these are the things that you have to do. I'm not doing that mission, fifth grade mission project for you. I'm doing it with you. Let's work on this together. And I think we were able to do that. Um, yeah, I, the most important thing is to don't hash it out in front of the kids. It, it, you know, almost 95% of us are going to be different in our parenting styles than the spouse that we have. And so you've got to work that out. You've got to decide where's the line that we're going to draw that's the hard line and then work our way around that. And uh, as long as you do that and you keep talking with each other, you, you, yeah, it's frustrating. It's hard. This isn't easy at all. There's nothing easy about this. But as long as it's not being hashed out in front of the kids, um, then you've got a chance of making it work. Okay, so how do you create a culture within a family where instead of being ruled by shame, like failure is terminal, 
that failure is kind of normal. It's a part of how we grow. How do we create that culture in our family? I don't know any other way to do it other than model it. Uh, you've, got, you've got to do things, and when you fail, you've got to own it and put it out in front of people and just and confess what's, what went wrong, learn from it, and go ahead. And, and so I, I would say in front of your kids, are you, are you constantly doing things that you fail at and then modeling that failure and learning from it and say, talking about what you failed? Are you willing to do things you're not good at so that they can see what it's like to, to struggle with things, to learn new things? to try new things that you're not necessarily great at. I mean, I don't know any other way to do this other than model it uh, and, and champion it whenever you see it. Whenever you see something like this kid kick through wood, you go, wow, watch this, you know, the, and stop it in the middle of it going, you think he's gonna break it? Man, this is the weakest kick I've ever seen. You know, and, and you, can, you can celebrate it whenever you see it and model it. I don't know if you've got any other ideas. Good conversation, uh, communication, talking about things, uh, with your kids all the time, different things you watch and see that either model what you want to have as the value or what it's not and the negative part of it. I think um, so many, uh, sometimes we think, oh, well, our kids won't understand this or so forth, and that's okay. They may be too small or they actually may not want to talk about it, but you just talking about it, that conversation with them, as, as so many of us know, those times in the car are sometimes the best times there are because we're all in there together. You can't run away. You can't watch you know, other things in separate rooms or so forth, but to have those dialogues and those conversations about the things that are important. So having a conversation is, you know, why is it important that we try things that we may not be good at? What does that develop in us? What could come out of that? Taking them to the scriptures and letting them see the things that God has for them and, um, and just continuing to have those conversations. I'd also say magic words in parenting, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I blew it. My wife's superpower is she knows how to fall on her sword when she messes up in front of the kids and that teaches them something they're gonna use with Jesus for the rest of their lives. And it's so good. Yeah, that's a superpower I don't really want. <laughs> <laughs> My superpower is to fall on the sword. I think, we're, I think, I think Dana's saying we're done. She, that's, she's the top, keeper of the top. She's the rule follower. So. <laughs> we wanted to do something at the end of the series, especially around parenting, that gave you a visual opportunity to kind of surrender your kids, surrender this whole process Maybe something that we said will be helpful for you. Maybe it's, it's caused a reaction of something else that might be helpful for you. Um, but in the midst of that, we've, we're gonna give you an opportunity um, to be able to uh, take one ribbon per family and, and write the names of your kids on there. And then at each of the different sites, they'll do different things with the ribbons. But I just wanna remind you of this, of this great character trait of the God that we serve. In Genesis chapter 22, Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. It seems like a very unreasonable request. Abraham moves forward in it, we're told in Hebrews 11, believing that God's gonna do something else. And this is what we see in verse 13 of 20, Genesis 22. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his own son. And so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. G G um, there are many scholars that believe that it's possible that the very mountain that he was on, it was certainly in the region of Jerusalem, and it could have been the very mountain that the cross, Calvary's cross was on. And Abraham gives God one of his great names, Jehovah Jireh, God who provides. As you surrender this process to him, what you're gonna find is that God will provide for you. You will have wisdom that you don't presently have. What are you gonna do when they turn 12? You will find it. There's no hypothetical grace. He doesn't give you the grace to raise a 12-year-old when they're only four. He will give you grace when they're 12. God will provide. And so we wanna use this ribbon, ribbon process as just kind of a proclamation that we embrace that, we believe that. And we'll tell you kind of how to do it in just a minute. Let me pray for us.
Father, we confess to you that um, our hearts are prone to try to run away from anything hard. That's true in our own lives. That's true in our children's lives. That's true in our spouse's lives. We, we don't like perseverance. And yet you tell us that the road to character, the road to hope is through perseverance and the perseverance in suffering very particularly. And so God, I pray for all of us, myself certainly included, especially included, that I would embrace the hard processes in my life that you might accomplish in me what you're trying to accomplish. And we thank you, God. We thank you that this is possible because we have been declared righteous. That the work of Christ on our behalf has completely paid the penalty of sin. And now we can walk in relationship with you in this process of being, having character developed and, and moving forward because of the salvation that is ours in Jesus. We can, no matter how stormy the seas, no matter how dark the night, we can say it is well. It is well with us. Because you are the God who provides. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name.